Hey, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of the Tree of Life Church podcast. It's our prayer that these messages help connect you to the life, love, and power of Jesus. All right, let's dive into this word, shall we? And get right into it. All right, I've asked Daniel if he could put up a picture of my family. We are in a family series, family life. Uh, I wanted to introduce my family to you. Uh, I've got three children. Uh, the youngest is Cooper there in the middle. He just turned three. And then I have a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old, uh, Clara and Kate. And then my husband, Spencer, right there in the NBTX hoodie. <laughs> and then my dog. So this is my family, uh, my kids' third generation tree of lifers being raised in the word. Uh, and they are um, full of grace <laughs> and allowing me to do what I do. Uh, and I just absolutely love them. I love the gift that God has given me in them. You know, I've heard this, um, a very wise person once told me, Janae, your family is your first God-given ministry. So steward it well. So somebody might need to hear that today. Your family is your first God-given ministry. Steward it well. Amen. Amen. All right. So last week, we're going to dive right in. Last week, Pastor Don spoke about the heroes of faith. Family life, heroes of faith. We talked about Noah, Moses, and Rahab. This week, we're going to take a look at equipping our families from generation to generation to generation. And then also expose some of the traps that the enemy sets for us as we look to hand off the word of God from generation to generation to generation. So family life, title of this message today is life and death. Life and death. So Pastor Don last week talked about Moses and how Moses' mom put him in a basket and set him on the Nile River and thus set the course for the rest of his life, a God-ordained life in leadership and in delivering the people of Israel, the children of Israel, out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt. So we're gonna do a quick review of the book of Exodus, very quick, in 30 seconds or less. <laughs> so hang on. Okay, so Moses grew up. Following God, he led the people through a difficult power struggle with the Egyptians. And really what this turns out to be is God proving himself to his people, but also proving himself to a pagan people. It's the story of, of a softening of a heart and a hardening of a heart. It's the story of life and death. We know the story. Moses came and said, let my people go. Pharaoh said, no. And so there were the 10 plagues. We had water to blood, frogs, gnats, flies, Egyptian livestock killed, boils, hail, locusts, darkness. Let my people go. No, 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 no. And then the death of the firstborn, which is where we get our Passover. And it's the picture of Jesus and the redemption that his blood has for us. After that, they were let go. Pharaoh said, go. And so they were led out into the wilderness and here was the children of Israel in the wilderness and this is what they got to experience. I wonder what this was like. God's presence appeared to them in a pillar of fire at night to light the way in the darkness. And a cloud by day to shade them from the hot sun. The physical, tangible presence of God was there for them to see. As they move towards the Red Sea in their great exodus, Pharaoh changes his mind and he says, wait a second, I want you to come back. I don't wanna lose you. I like all the labor that you provide for me in bondage and slavery. So he chases after them and then we have the Red Sea incident where God parts the Red Sea, children of Israel go across, and then Pharaoh's army is defeated as the waters come in over the top of them. The most powerful person in the entire planet, on the entire planet at that time was the Pharaoh. And so God demonstrating his great power. I also believe that there are 10 plagues because God was demonstrating his great patience towards Pharaoh time and time and time again. He could have done whatever after the first no, but he didn't. His great patience, abounding in love and mercy, our great God. All right, once they got into the wilderness, 
past the Red Sea. Egyptian army is no longer a threat. They get to a problem of no water. And all they have, there's a pond of water, but it's bitter water and they can't drink it. And so Moses petitions the Lord and he says, God tells Moses, throw this log in the water. Maybe a slight test of whether or not Moses is going to believe what God says. Moses does it, the water is now made drinkable. So all the people are able to drink that water. Then after that, they had a different problem. There was a food problem, and we know the story of manna from from heaven, and the instructions only go out and collect what your family needs for the day and that day alone. And what God was doing is he was proving that he is more than enough. He is that daily provider for us. He was establishing himself with his people that had been in bondage for 400 years. He was retraining their brain. It was a pathway of trust. All right, after that, we had another water problem, and that's when the water came out of the rock. So at this point, there was no water. There wasn't even bitter water. (laughs) There was no water to be found, and water came out of the rock. God's amazing, miraculous, impossible provision right there for the people to see. And then after that, there was a passage problem, which is when it was the the first battle of the Israelites with Amalek. (laughs) And the king said, you can't go through my country. I'm not gonna let you pass through. So there was a little bit of a battle. This is when, you'll remember the story, Moses went on the mountain and he held up his staff. And when he held up his staff, the army prevailed. When it came down, they started to lose. And that's when Aaron came alongside of him and held up his arms. And this is also very interesting because it's the first mention of Joshua. Did you know Joshua was just 19 when he came out of Egypt, around about there? He was a teenager when he experienced the Exodus. So he's seeing all these great wonders that God is performing. He is watching, he is paying attention. And not only that, he must have been a mighty man because he was the one that Moses picked. Hey, Joshua, I want you to go to battle. I'm gonna go up here on this mountain. (laughs) Joshua's probably like, oh, great, great. And you're gonna do what with that stick up there? I don't, (laughs) amazing. But he was obedient in that. Joshua was obedient in leading the people. This is key, first mention of Joshua as a young man. After that, we had the Ten Commandments and the establishment of God's covenant. Just as a quick review, commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, no idols. (laughs) And then we had the golden calf incident, which broke number one and two. So then we had to have a renewal of that covenant to remind the people God's goodness, God's faithfulness, his mighty strength, what he has done for you. I tell you, I don't want to serve a God I've created. I don't want to serve a God that I've made up. Moving along. After that covenant renewal, Moses set up something that was really interesting called the tent of meeting. Now the tent of meeting was a place outside the Israelite camp where Moses would go to to seek the face of the Lord. And he would have to go often because there was water problems and there's passage problems and there was food problems. He would go to the Lord, the people would complain and he would go to the Lord and say, I don't know what to do with these people you gave me. So he would seek the face of the Lord to get the answer, right? To seek direction. What do we do now? What do we do now? Here's another key component here. This is when Joshua is mentioned for the second time. Joshua. Moses' assistant, a young man, a young man, after Moses departed from the tent of meeting where the presence of the Lord would come down in a cloud, Joshua would not depart. Moses, after he was seeking the face of the Lord, he would not, he departed, Joshua stayed. He remained. After that, we had the plans for the tabernacle that was kind of like, it wasn't a building, it was a tent that the people came together and put together and the presence of God rested on top of that. And from that point forward, as they journeyed into the promised land, 
When the presence of the Lord settled on top of that tabernacle, the people knew to stay put. And when the presence of the Lord lifted off of that tabernacle, the people would move. And that was their journey, completely dependent on God and his presence. And then Moses, on his 120th birthday, it's really interesting, it says in the word, I am 120 years old today. And then he gives this address. 120 years old, this is at the end of his life, one of the greatest leaders to have ever lived, a hero of faith, and he's about to give an address basically on his deathbed. I think we should pay attention, yeah? (laughs) This is what he says. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're gonna look at verses 19 and 20. I'm reading from the Message Bible. It says this, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. I place before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life so that you and your children will live and love God, your God, listening, obedient to him, firmly embracing him. Oh yes, he is life itself, a long life settled on the soil that God, your God, promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There came a critical point (laughs) where Moses died, the great hero of faith. Joshua chapter one, verse two says, Moses, my servant, is dead. So now what? So now, okay, now we have the book of Joshua. Here we go. Moses, my servant, is dead. Cue Joshua, commissioned by God to succeed Moses and bring the children of Israel into the promised land. And then conquer it. Going off of what Moses had already established, all the people seeing the faithfulness of God and the power that the God of the universe had over all the other created gods. And here's the summary of the book of Joshua. When Israel obeyed God, Israel won. When Israel disobeyed God, they lost. They had to pick one, life or death. Life or death. Hopefully Israel learned their lesson. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. But in the end, Israel took the promised land. They went in because of their obedience. Yeah, they had to be delayed 40 years, there's that. (laughs) But at the end, it was the next generation that came in the promised land and they went in because of their obedience and they inhabited houses that they did not build. They harvested in fields they did not plant. What that translates to is a tremendous blessing that they didn't work for because of the faithfulness of God to them. It's God's love story to a fickle people. Faithful God, fickle people. (laughs) That would have been a great message title. (laughs) They had to pick one. Pick one. Life or death. Now we have Joshua, he enters the promised land, he ushers in the victory, and now he is himself 110 years old, end of his life. He also gives an address, so of course we wanna pay attention. And in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15, he says this. Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day who you will serve. He put a timestamp on that, didn't he? He didn't say, wait until everything's okay financially. Wait until your kids are older. Wait until you have kids. Wait until you're in a desperate situation. He said, choose this day who you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, leading by example, we will serve the Lord. You know, we have a past back here in Egypt, a hard one, a difficult one, 
full of gods that did not love us, created gods. There's a huge past of bondage and slavery. And where we are currently, there is a culture that has gods made of their own that they serve, pressing culture, living in the land that you are about to take. You choose. As for me and my house, regardless of the past, regardless of the current culture, we will serve the Lord. Your choice, your choice will affect generations to come. Your choice will affect generations to come. Whenever he said this, whenever Josh said this, he, was said, he said me, as for me, and then he expanded to my house, my children, my grandchildren. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Pick one, life or death, pick one. Today, Joshua says, I choose life. Your choice affects generations to come. And here's the deal. Moses was 120 years old when he gave his last speech saying, serve the Lord, pick one, pick one. Joshua was 110. Here's the good news for us. If you are still breathing, it is not too late to make this resolve with your family. You are not too old. Not too much time has gone by. Your kids are not too old. He was on his deathbed when he said this. Yes, he lived a life loving the Lord, following after him, conquered enemy kings, a mighty man of God. Yet he still made this resolve at the end of his life because he wasn't necessarily concerned about all the, the glory and, and valor and, and, and prestige that he earned himself as a man. Yes, that was mighty. He was more concerned about the generations to come. He knew that the plans and purposes of God is not to stop with him. He knew that the scope of that is far beyond his generation. The plans and purposes of God go on and on and on. It's so much bigger than just us in this moment right now. So much bigger. If you are still breathing, it is not too late. Joshua at the end of his life was concerned with one thing, that the next generation would serve the Lord. As we serve the Lord, as we make that decision, us, for our families, we've got a responsibility to pass it on. We have a responsibility to pass it on. Deuteronomy chapter six. Verses five through nine, love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love him with all that is in you. Love him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I have given you today on your hearts and get them inside of you and then inside of your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to the time you fall in bed at night. Whew, isn't that a picture of parenting right there? <laughs> you get up in the morning and then you fall in bed at night. You're so tired, right? This is talking about an entire day, a lifestyle. Every moment of every day, infuse the word of God in your home. Tie them on your hands and on your foreheads as a reminder. Have them ever before your eyes. Your hands and your foreheads. You make choices with your hands. Well, you make choices with your brain first on your forehead. And then you do stuff with your hands, right? Let the word of God be the filter through all of that. Inscribe them on the doorpost of your homes and on your city gates. Here's the key, get them inside of you, the word of God, the words that the Lord spoke, get them inside of you so then you can pass them on to your children. 
It starts with you. It starts with us. You see, a very interesting thing happened with the leadership transition between Moses, Joshua, and then Joshua's final address, and it's this. Whenever Moses died, Joshua was commissioned. After Joshua's battle and then close to death, Joshua gives this plea, and he says, choose you this day who you will serve. Me and my house, this is what we're going to do. The transfer of leadership went from Joshua to the heads of households. That's us. That's you and that's me. And we've got to stop blaming the generation that went on ahead of us, saying they didn't do their job. And we've got to stop looking back behind saying the generation that's coming up isn't worth it. Because here we stand, we do something. We pass it on. We make that choice. It starts with us. Get them inside of you, and then get the word of God inside our children. The transfer of leadership went to families. This is powerful. Hang on to this. One of the subtle attacks of our enemy is to separate families. He knows how powerful the family unit is. After we get it inside of us, we impart it to our kids. We've got to make it a lifestyle. You know, in that scripture, he didn't say, oh, on Sunday mornings is when you do this. Or when you're having a really rough time, that's whenever you should seek the face of the Lord. Or maybe just at mealtime, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Oh, he's saying, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same and everything in between, you're gonna talk about it. You're gonna spend time with your family and infuse them with the word of God. In order for that to happen, we must not be distracted. You know, the song that the worship team sang, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. And there's tremendous power in that. If you'll direct your eyes to the screen, I have a short clip for you to watch. Good. Saying goodbye in their own way. Playing outlawed tunes on outlawed pipes. It was the same for me and your daddy when our father was killed. teacher to use this. It is not enough for our children just to know about the Word of God. They need to know how to use it. They need to know what's in here. They need to know the story of the character and nature of God the mighty battles that he has fought while we stood still. They need to know who they are in Christ, that they are more than conquerors. They need to know that this, the word of God, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. 
that it rightly divides the word of truth, separating out truth and lie. It's not enough that they just have one. They need to know how to use it. We've gotta get it inside of us first and then teach them, we pass it on. It becomes a lifestyle. Your choice will be caught. You choose life or death. The choice that you choose will be caught by your children. They'll see it. You've gotta pick one and then pass it on. Because whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, if you don't pick one, you can't soar through in neutral. Your choice, your choice will be caught. It's our responsibility to pass it on. And if you don't tell the story, the story stops with you. If you don't tell the story, the story stops with you. And I'm here to tell you this, our enemy wants to disarm you so he can disarm our children. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. People are not our enemy. We fight an enemy that is after you, that is after your family, that is after your kids. And I'm here to tell you this, there is no baby devil. There is no toddler devil. There is no teen devil. The enemy that our children face is the same enemy that you and I face. Life and death. Pass it on. You see, when the children of Israel forgot the Lord their God, they didn't pass down the story from generation to generation. Somewhere the story stopped. And by the grace of God, somewhere, somehow, someone picked it back up. And perhaps that's you sitting in your chair today. Perhaps you are the first one in a long time to sit in church in your family. Today it starts with you. Perhaps you're like me and you've had several generations in church making the choice to choose life. Perhaps you're well advanced in years and you've decided it's not too late to start. It's not too late to tell my family. You see, the children of Israel forgot their Lord. The story wasn't transferred to the next generation and they began to do what was evil in the eyes of the Lord and that became the story that was passed down. And the story of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, actually is a really neat story because it talks about how the word of the Lord was found and the people were so far removed from it when they opened that book and they read it, they wept because they had been so far away from what God had intended. They were so far down the lane of death, they didn't even have their view on life. And they had a course correction. I'm so thankful for God's grace, by God's grace. Here's the deal though. When the story didn't get passed down, when the enemy came, they could not stand against the attack. The result was an, a life outside of the promises of God without a future and without a hope. You see, the enemy knows this. If he can take this out, he has taken our only offensive weapon. If we stop the story with us, our children are disarmed going to battle. The enemy knows this. And you see the enemy, hear this. 
The devil, the devil knows this. If the next generation does not know how to use their sword, then they're already defeated. And there's something super scary about a child to the devil. And this is why, because Jesus said, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must have faith like a child. Childlike faith. Jesus says it, I believe it, end of story. There is nothing more powerful than that in the kingdom of God, pushing back the darkness. So you give a child this, armed with the word of God, filled with the spirit of truth, believing what God says and going forth after it, there is nothing that would stop them. Subtle attack by the enemy, a subtle trap. Disarm the children, disarm the parents, fracture the home, distract, disarm. We must be aware. It isn't enough for the next generation just to know about the word of God. They need to know how to use it. And this is super important because one day it's going to be their turn. One day it's going to be their turn. We're gonna skip ahead 800 years after the death of Joshua. And if I did my math right, that's 25 generations. If a generation is about 25 years. 25 generations, so you can see the passing down of the word of God from generation to generation to generation to generation times 25. And we see the account in the book of Daniel whenever King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, besieged Jerusalem. And the reason Jerusalem was attacked was because for many years, even though they had chances to turn around, they had forgotten the Lord their God. And so this was judgment against the people. However, there were four youth, four teenagers that remembered the Lord their God. And when Nebuchadnezzar's people came in and took these four people captive, it was Daniel Hananiah, Misael, and Azariah, who remembered their roots, and although they were taken captive to a pagan land and a pagan culture, and about to be schooled in the art of all things pagan, remembered the Lord their God. They were armed with the word of God. And at the time, the Babylonian Empire had all kinds of things to offer. It was the richest of the rich, the most luscious of lush, and they were receiving food from the king's table. So if they were struggling just a little bit in Jerusalem to put a lamb chop on the table, you can imagine what it was like receiving food from the king's table. So there were all kinds of temptations for them to be immersed in this culture and just as the saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. They didn't have their parents. Their parents were gone, perhaps killed, deported, exiled somewhere else. It was just them. If we look in Daniel chapter three, verses 16 through 18, leading up to this story, what had happened was Nebuchadnezzar was a king that was so full of himself, so lost. He built a statue, a golden statue that was 90 feet tall. And he told all the people that he had captured in all of his kingdom, he said, whenever the music plays, I want you to bow down and worship this statue. And if you don't, I'm gonna throw you into this furnace over here, basically death by fire. You're gonna burn yourself, you're gonna be burned to death if you do not obey my command. And so the music played, everybody bowed, except for who we now know Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now here's the key. I gave you three different names before. Whenever they were immersed into the culture, what they did was so brutal. They actually took the names and changed your name. So everything about you, they took from you. Stripped everything from you, including your name. The names that they had before were attributes of God 
and his faithfulness. That's what they meant. When they changed the names, it reflected pagan idols. So whenever the time came, they did not bow. You can imagine, powerful Babylonian king, he was kind of upset. But God had given them favor. And so he said, I'm gonna give you a second chance. Maybe you didn't hear, maybe you didn't catch the memo, I sent you an email. Here's the deal. Whenever the music plays, you must bow down to this golden statue and worship this golden statue. And in case you didn't hear, the punishment is death. And here is their reply. It's their turn. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaring furnace and anything else you might cook up. But even if he doesn't, even if he chooses not to deliver us in this way, it wouldn't make a bit of difference. We still won't serve your gods or the golden statue you've set up. That firm resolve, it is their turn. Here's the deal. When we pass it on to the next generation, they're going to have the choice of life and death. They're going to be greatly influenced by the choice that we have made and the lifestyle that we have lived. But when they make their choice, their choice will be tried. You see here, this is actually the second time that their choice was tried. The first time was with the pressing culture. If you're about to go off to college, pay attention to this. One of the most subtle attacks of the enemy, it goes under the radar. The attack is the subtle infiltration of culture that we allow to influence us, that gets us just slightly off track. The subtle attack of the enemy is to get you derailed when you're in a removed environment where the pressures and culture are contrary to what you know. Your choice will be tried. It will be tried. And then at this point, the Message Bible says it so well. King Nebuchadnezzar did not like their reply. And in fact, he was enraged. The Message Bible says he was purple with anger. So he had the furnace kicked up seven times its original heat. And he had the men bound and he threw them in. And it was so hot that even the men that threw them in were consumed by the fire. Here's the cool part though. It was their turn. They made their resolve. They made their stand. They knew who God was. They knew the story, and here is their story, it's their turn. Suddenly, this is Daniel chapter three, 24 and 25. Suddenly, King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm and said, did we not throw three men bound hand and foot into the fire? That's right, O king, they said, but look, he said, I see four men. I see four walking around freely in the fire, completely unharmed, and the fourth man, that fourth man looks like the son of God. You see, when you take your stand, your testimony is how you stand in the fire and people see Jesus. When you stand in the fire, when you are tried, with your choice of life and death, I choose life, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. People see Jesus. People see Jesus. Here's the cool thing. When they came up out of that furnace, their clothes were not burned, their hair was not singed, and they didn't even smell like fire. Untouched. That's the God we serve. <laughs> Can you imagine going home with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, perhaps even Daniel that night, and the conversation around the dinner table? I mean, <laughs> Absolutely amazing. Life and death. We pick one. 
we pass it on because one day it'll be their turn. Thanks again for joining us this week. We pray that this message encouraged and inspired you. If you want to find out how you can be a part of Tree of Life, just go to our website, treeoflifechurch.org. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and share it with a friend.